Okay. Um, good morning. This is uh, Senate Judiciary, Thursday, March 11th, 2021. And we are taking up S3 and act relating to competency, competency to stand trial and sanity as a defense. Many of us have had problems logging in this morning, so I hope people understand we're getting we're starting a little bit late. It is not due to deals being made in the back room. It's due to technical difficulties. So I was among those with frozen out. So Pepper or David, do you want to start um, with the work that you did with the Department of Mental Health to break a log jam? Well, uh, sure. For the record, um, James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, just picking up from where we left off yesterday, I just wanted to apologize to the Department of Mental Health and to the committee that um, we didn't invite them in in our initial conversations. I think uh, they were broadly supportive of, of some of the changes. They just needed to kind of review um, and make, make some amendments to the language. But I think that conceptually, um, we were we ended up being on the same page, and you know we met yesterday for about an hour or so, and uh, came up, uh, had some subsequent conversations, and came up with an amendment, which is posted on the website. Um, it amends uh, the draft 1.1 that we reviewed yesterday. Um, so, um, and it, it really kind of uh, amends section three, subsection C2, and uh, about notice and uh, to the state's attorneys and to victims. And, and maybe David, I might hand it over to you to walk through. And can we have it on the, uh, in front of us? Can we have it on the screen? Is that possible? <clears throat> if I can, I can pull it up if that would be helpful. If, that, if that's okay with Senator Sears. Fine with me, Senator. We just need your co-host, Eric. Thanks, Peggy. It's, there you go. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Eric. And for the record, David Chair, the sure. General's Office. Um, and I want to echo Pepper's, uh, Attorney Pepper's, uh, both apologies and appreciation for work with uh, rapid work with the department over the last day. So we, there's actually not a huge number of textual changes here, but there are uh, a few key ones. And in part, some of these changes are to address HIPAA concerns, which um, I can speak to in broad generalities, but if there are specific questions on that, I would turn it over to representatives from the department. The first change uh, well, here- Before you start, David, I want to take this opportunity and say, I think I already took the blame. So I might as well continue to take the blame for not having shared the document with other people before it was on the website. So, I, you know, you guys can, it was my responsibility to make sure the Department of Mental Health and other members of the committee had the amendment. And I was in the midst of working on it and I'm not offering any it's my responsibility as chair of the committee to make sure everything's in the world that's happening in place. So um, I appreciate the fact that you um, you and Pepper went to, and worked with the Department of Mental Health to <clears throat> break, broker a deal, but you don't have to take responsibility. That really was mine. Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Um, uh, so looking at 2A here, what is now 2A again. Um, mm -hmm. you'll, the committee will remember previously this laid out uh, a, a list of offenses for which notice would be granted. And then the initial oh. change to, uh, I should say the initial change from last year's bill uh, was that there would be no 
restricted list. Notice would go out for all offenses. And after mm -hmm. discussing things with the department, uh, we came to this conclusion, which is notice is still could go out for uh, basically any offense with a couple caveats that it would happen. The, the notice provisions would apply when somebody has been found not guilty by reason of insanity or if somebody is found incompetent to stand trial and <clears throat> the person in this criminal case has not been dismissed. So uh, in those instances where somebody has been found incompetent and a state's attorney or the attorney general were to dismiss the case, which currently does happen at times, uh, these notice provisions would not continue in part because at least going forward, I think the understanding will be that if a case has been dismissed, it means that there are not the sort of ongoing public safety concerns that would animate the, the need for uh, the, the, the desire to have notice going out to the prosecutors. If, uh, you know, if the case stays open, that's a signal that there is these public safety concerns and it will also, and that also helps address some of the HIPAA concerns around making sure that uh, information is being shared only in those circumstances when it's necessary for public safety issues. Um, May I ask a question here about provided the person's criminal case has not been dismissed? Sure. Um, we have the cases in Chittenden County that are fairly high profile um, where uh, someone's case was dis dismissed by the state's attorney in Chittenden County and then the um, Attorney General's office decided to, or in consultation, I guess, with the governor's office, decided to prosecute the cases. What does that do to this? To that, what what does this do to that? I'm sorry. <clears throat> I mean, if there is an ongoing case, then notice will be provided. So once the case restarted under the uh, aegis of the attorney general's office that, uh, you know, if this were to have been the, if this were the law and that happened again, then notice would be given to the attorney general as the prosecuting office. So uh, when you say that the case has not been, dis that um, if you dismiss the, I think it's probably misleading to suggest that the person is no longer dangerous if the case has been dismissed. Well, so, and again, this, this will require, uh, as many cases do, serious decisions to be made by prosecuting officials about what needs to be uh, tracked and, and what doesn't. And I, I think that's the case now, and that'll continue to be the case uh, in terms of the gravity of these decisions. It's also important to remember that there is a category of cases that are essentially very are very often low level misdemeanors, disorderly conducts and so forth, where somebody is found incompetent to stand trial. And it may be a very reasonable decision for a state's attorney to say, well, this person is not competent. Um, this is very, this is low level, the disturbing behavior, you know, low level behavior that is um, uh, annoying quality of life type of crimes, but that it's really not appropriate or necessary to keep the criminal system involved and to let the order of non-hospitalization, whatever might result from the finding of non-competence to proceed without the criminal system staying involved. So I don't remember the town. There was a town in the Northeast Kingdom where people were constantly heard trumpets. Uh, the guy would blow, play his trumpet to annoy yeah. his neighbors. Yeah. That type of case you're thinking of? It says things like that. Yeah, noise in an apartment building, things like that. And uh, and so, so this really tries to get at both uh, or attempts to provide an avenue to address both of those where there's some where it's perfectly appropriate to let it exit the criminal system entirely and others where prosecutors really need to have eyes on what's happening for public safety reasons. And, and this allows them to make those decisions and to retain that notice in cases where that's necessary. Just, yeah, Alice. So this- uh, Senator Nick. Yeah, no problem. So basically this is the state's attorney will be in the driver's seat as to determine um, this section. 
Is that true? They'll totally be on their own to determine this. I think that that's fair to say that they will have their decision is going to be key as to whether they get notice uh, on these cases after there's a finding of incompetence. They, they can choose to retain notice simply by keeping the case open, uh, or they can choose to uh, no longer get notice by dismissing the case, and that will be in their wheelhouse. Okay, okay thanks. Most of the rest of the changes, I, if there are no more questions no. on that, I'll keep on, keep on going. A lot of the blue changes, sorry, the changes are in blue and most of them are numbering changes as you'll see. Um, we go down to what is now C capital C1, CI, yep. or the next substantive changes. And the first change in blue here you'll see is really a clarification and making sure the intent is captured by the language of the provision. Um, it could have been, before this was added, it could have been read that somebody was committed under this section and also was subject to a non-hospitalization order, but that non-hospitalization order had not happened as a result of their commitment under this section. In other words, it had been some, something else was going on that uh, resulted in non-hospitalization orders. So we're clarifying that what we're talking about here is non-hospitalization orders that issue as a result of criminal involvement and they fall under this section. So it's really a drafting issue, not really a substantive issue, I think, just capturing the original intent more clearly. The next big change is at the bottom here, eliminating the uh, provision that the court could proceed under 7618B, which was a is, is a provision that allows for a court to reconsider an order of non-hospitalization and to um, either alter that order or to uh, change it to an order of hospitalization potentially. <clears throat> it's important to remember that people subject to an order of non-hospitalization, uh, for people subject to order of non-hospitalization, 7618B remains in the law. So such a second look could still continue. This just means that's going to clearly be happening on the family court side, not on the criminal court side. Uh, you know, this was a, this result after speaking with the department was a result, was uh, a balancing of serious concerns around making sure that purely treatment decisions are being handled uh, in accordance with a clinical eye to them uh, and not having criminal courts engaging too heavily on what are purely clinical <laughs> decision making. Um, but we're also trying to balance that by retaining the notice provision so state's attorneys still or the attorney general's office will still be getting notice if there are issues. Um, and we think this is both the department and, and our offices think this is a reasonable, a reasonable compromise, uh, try to balance those two policy concerns and a reasonable way to move forward at this time. Right. Thank you. Um, anybody with a comment or uh, questions on the committee on this? And um, if uh, Morning Fox or Karen Marble want to comment? I uh, think, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Uh, first, I'd like to say I appreciate uh, the plethora of apologies uh, uh, today. Uh, none really needed. Uh, like I said yesterday, a lot of things going on, and we're all trying to manage as best we can, uh, especially during uh, the pandemic. Uh, but I'm just glad uh, that this worked out. Uh, it's a very good collaborative effort. Uh, I have no other comments. I think uh, Attorney Shear covered it very well uh, and captured uh, the intent and the conversation that we had. Uh, and I would just like to express my particular thanks uh, to Attorney Shear and Attorney Pepper um, and, uh, uh, and Eric Fitzpatrick as well, uh, and our counsel, Karen Barber, uh, for quickly turning this around and uh, uh, having a good collaborative effort. So I'll just leave it at that. So I guess we'll go back to our regular witnesses now that we have the change, um, which starting with Judge Grierson. Shall I take the document down, Senator Sears, or? Oh yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I wanna mention while 
Eric is changing the screen. So, uh, unfortunately, Senator White is ill this morning and is not joining us. Uh, good morning, Senator, uh, Chairman Sears and the committee. Thank you uh, for allowing me to testify this morning. For the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, uh, testifying on uh, amendments to S3, I believe. Um, you know, I, I don't have any uh, opposition to the amendment that uh, David and the group have uh, put forward. I will note on the first amendment where it talks about um, notice if a case has not been dismissed. And I understand the concern on the part of the committee and everyone about uh, violent offenders um, who has who have been found incompetent, maybe under uh, in the custody of the Department of Mental Health, and I, I understand uh, the need for uh, states' attorneys to um, be involved in the decision, um, and that's important. One of the things, and I'm just trying to verify it uh, as we're talking, that I have heard is that when some individuals and Pepper, or maybe it was David uh, mentioned low level offenses, disorderly conduct, where someone is found incompetent and they're released into the community on an order of non hospitalization. The question becomes what happens to the, the conditions of release that were imposed um, when the person first came into court? And if, in my view, uh, if the person is being released into the community under an ONH, um, I question the need for continued conditions of release uh, because then the question becomes, is the person uh, following conditions of release or the terms of the ONH? And um, I don't know how widespread it is. I, I've heard at least from one judge that, um, in other words, these cases can remain pending for a considerable period of time with conditions of release outstanding but there's no active case. The case has not been dismissed. And so I just raise that as, um, I don't know what, uh, what the state's attorney's reaction is to that, but I would think if someone's in the community, uh, there's no longer a need for those conditions of release. And uh, if they're released into the community, as opposed to a hospitalization, which obviously involves our, the most violent uh, offenses, I understand the need for keeping a case open in the, in the event the person retains competency, but I think on a lot of the low level misdemeanor offenses, it, it raises other issues. And so I just throw that out for the committee's consideration uh, to think about that. Because it, it truly is a discretionary call by the state's attorney's office. Um, I know when I was sitting regularly, it was routinely that uh, someone was found incompetent other than in those significant uh, cases. The cases were dismissed and the person was placed on the ONH. Um, and I'm, so I, I raised that, uh, raise that issue. Comments, questions? Thank you, Judge. Other comments on the bill, Judge? Uh, no, I, you want me to go back to the amendment for yesterday? I haven't testified before. Yeah. So, no, um, I know. That's, yeah. So let me go back to uh, what Eric sent me yesterday. I don't believe we had any concerns. Uh, more of a question, I guess, because I hadn't testified before. Under section, uh, it's on page three, uh, under line 1011, it struck that the rep would be represented by the Office of the Attorney General. Um, I'm assuming this is taking place at the time of the so-called hospitalization hearing. That's when um, Vermont Legal Aid would become involved at that point. Um, and I guess the question is who is representing the state at that point? It continues to be the state's attorney as opposed to the attorney general's office. Who wants to take that one on? 
Uh, Senator, I can jump in. This is actually the result of a discussion between the department and uh, the attorney general's office. You know, between the two entities, we anticipate that, well, we know that DMH will have the representation they need. Okay. The issue is that th in some cases, a conflict, a direct conflict within the attorney general's office can arise uh, if the attorney general is also prosecuting the case. But we are in discussions on that and we're confident we'll work that out administratively. Okay. Um, and I think that was, I'm just going quickly through this notice provisions. And if I read 3A, that's what we were talking about earlier, that when notice is provided to the committing court and to the state's attorney of the county where the pro we support that because I think there were, had been a question previously if it was just to the committing court um, you know, who's to enforce that order or attempt to enforce it. So I believe Senator with, with that, uh, we don't have any objections. Thank you. Um, any questions for the judge? Right. Matt Valerio. Good morning, Matt. Morning. Thank you for having me. I, I was watching with great interest yesterday uh, on YouTube, so I'm familiar with the uh, <clears throat> discussions that were had. Um, I have a couple of issues I wanted to bring up, um, and I guess now is as good a time as any. Um, in, in part of this uh, I did receive a copy of what uh, the Attorney General's Office of Legal Aid put together last night. My first glance through it was a little bit late, and I I was focusing on a different part of the bill, and I had represented to them that I had no concerns at all with that section that they had amended. Um, and at closer review, there was a an issue I wanted to bring up. And the... Uh, we, it starts with the 3A1, um, a person, uh, when a person has been committed to the section and subject to the order, um, and the person is not complying with the order, um, I was going to suggest that uh, language to the, to the effect of that the person is not substantially complying with the order where the lack of substantial compliance makes that person a danger to themselves or others, as opposed to having discretion to um, go back to the state's attorney and, and uh, where there are minor uh, deviations from the treatment plan, um, as opposed to something that is serious. And I know that with folks with mental illness, um, having represented a lot of people in my prior, uh, the prior part of my career who were under these circumstances, uh, there's a lot of discretion about when people are brought back. Um, and uh, um, it, I'd want to make sure that it was not for minor deviations from a case plan, but for something that is actually presents a danger and that there needs to be some, it, to me, this is a clinical evaluation more than it is a, um, it's not like a condition of release um, that you have from the, with the courts um, where it's really a per se kind of violation if you don't do a specific thing. Um, and so I throw that out there for your consideration. The uh, the biggest issues that uh, my office have, and I've run this by uh, the appellate division, um, with them having litigated uh, this issue most recently, is the um, section under section four. 
the amendment to Rule 16.1. Uh, what that section obviously says is that the uh, under the rule, the court can order a mental examination by a psychiatrist or an expert um, when there is a uh, finding that the defendant is not competent to stand trial. Um, and I think that really what this is, at this point in the proceeding, and the, this is what the, the case law says and what the law is, everybody in the courtroom, the judge, the prosecutor, and the defenders have the exact same interest, right? As a matter of law, that is everyone has an interest in making sure that somebody who is under the jurisdiction of the court in a criminal matter is competent to stand trial. The court wants to make sure that person is competent. The prosecutor has an obligation to make sure that person is competent before they pursue a criminal case, and so does the defendant. So in what this is basically saying is, is this, this issue is kind of unveiling or rolling back a what I see as a different an agenda that is contrary to what the Constitution requires and, a, and, and a, an agenda that is contrary to law, which is when you have an independent evaluate, court ordered evaluation and that evaluation is uh, comes out that says that the individual is not competent to stand trial. Um, it's saying to the uh, state's attorney that you get another bite at sort of another bite at the apple, not because there's anything wrong with the evaluation, but because you don't like the result of the evaluation. So I'm going to make a suggestion if you're going to do, I don't think that this is a problem in the law as it is. And I can go, and I'm going to go through um, a couple of, uh, of the uh, findings that the court has made in various cases regarding this issue. But if you have a court ordered evaluation by a neutral evaluator, uh, unless the state can, after having reviewed that uh, um, evaluation and any information that the court's evaluator expert has um, relied upon in making that evaluation, unless the state can show that that <clears throat> report falls be below the standard of care for what you have to do to actually make those reports, then there's no reason for the uh, state to have an additional evaluation because there's not an, uh, any allegation being made that, uh, or there would be no finding or a, ability to say that there was something wrong with, you know, that the person was not neutral, that they were biased, that they didn't uh, follow the standards for what you're supposed to do for an evaluation. All, all you're really saying is we don't like the result. Okay. And as a result, the state wants another bite at the apple so that we can pursue this person criminally. Um, and that is not, um, that is not an appropriate reason um, to allow a uh, uh, the state's attorney to get a, a second review of the individual. However, I would agree that if they, um, if the state's attorney looks at the information, consults with their own expert, and the expert says, "Look, this doesn't live up to um, appropriate standards of review. Uh, that this person has bias, and we can demonstrate this by." other things that they've done in their career or the like, uh, that this is not really a neutral court ordered psych evaluation, um, that this uh, evaluation is flawed, then they should have the opportunity legitimately to get a, to request that the court order a second um, independent evaluation. That's much different and it was very interesting that I, I heard the, the term defense expert shopping yesterday. 
um, from State's Attorney Marthage. When these evaluations are ordered, these are court ordered neutral psychological evaluations, not ordered through my office, but not paid for by my office. Um, they are court ordered evaluations. Um, and so in fact, what this is suggesting is that the state's attorneys can actually um, expert shop so that they can get a different result from the neutral evaluation that the court uh, ordered evaluation produced with no showing that there is anything biased or substandard with the evaluation that the, uh, that the court has uh, ordered and received. This is one of the things that uh, uh, was addressed in the Shero case in the last within the last couple of years, and the court in that case talked about the exact same things that I just talked about, and also talked about the dangers of what occurs when you allow the state to involuntarily evaluate a defendant in a pending criminal case. Um, and one of the one of the things it talked about is a, a constitutional rub that there would be a, a, quote an inherent and possibly un and possibly unfair advantage leaning insight into defense strategy by allowing the state to evaluate um, independently an individual who is the subject of a, a criminal. Uh, complaint. That is, a defendant under the under Fifth Amendment under their Fifth Amendment rights has no obligation to speak uh, at all during the uh, state uh, you know the state's pursuit of the case. Um, an evaluation like this would potentially violate Fifth Amendment rights, um, and. Uh, allow the uh, uh, effectively the state to get a statement contrary to the Constitution um, under the guise of doing a uh, mental evaluation, um, even when the evaluation that was first performed uh, was one that was by a neutral evaluator, not an evaluator. Um, who was selected by uh, the, de the defense. Um, the bottom line here is that I think that you run into constitutional pro Fifth Amendment constitutional problems here by allowing the state to examine uh, a client um, with a, in a pending criminal case and there's no showing, particularly when there's no showing that the process that has been followed is um, flawed. So to me, absent some kind of showing that the uh, state ordered purportedly neutral evaluation is flawed, biased, in some way, flawed or biased or, or doesn't live up to the standards of uh, um, medical and psychological um, testing, uh, the state should not have an, obligate, uh, an ability to get another one. And if they get another one, it should be another neutral evaluation, not one that allows the state to um, shop for whatever psychiatrist or psychologist they want um, they can do that and have there's after the after the fact if there's a if they want to contest it the state just like just like our, our, my office does if we don't like the result of a um, of an evaluation that the the court does we can go out and hire an independent person and then have that person testify why uh, the the state was uh, wrong or the the neutral evaluation was wrong but. Uh, uh, we, we'll do paper reviews. We'll do all of the stuff that and any kind of privately, and I don't mean not privately, but uh, 
independent, uh, retained by either the defense or re retained by the prosecution expert would do um, to say why the neutral evaluation was wrong and why, in our case, a jury should uh, disregard that if, if there is a diminished capacity defense or an insanity defense or something like that. And the state can do the same thing. But what we're talking about here is independent neutral evaluations um, that are not chosen by the defense um, that really just gives the state a second bite at the apple. I thought this was the heart of the bill, frankly. Well, this is how do you how do you not how do you protect the public without providing some information to the state's attorney about the risk of the subject? We're talking. This is Rule sixteen point one deals with a with a what you're doing to decide what to try a case. I understand that. That this isn't about the hospitalization uh, hearing or not order of non hospitalization. Information regarding protection of the public um, would be the subject of the hospitalization hearing, not the uh, not the criminal trial. The criminal. The criminal trial is about whether or not the person. Well, you're not going to have a criminal trial because the person's found. Maybe I'm missing something. Oh, I, I, you're not going to have a criminal trial because the person is found not competent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. Correct. And then well, how do we protect? After, how do we protect the public? That's, that's what, the whole issue in this bill, is, Matt. Is how do we protect the public? And it, one of the problems that has been identified is the state's attorneys are kind of left out of the mat, out of the loop. You're missing something here. And what you're missing okay. is that the next stage in the process after somebody is found incompetent or insane is to move, move to the level of the hospitalization hearing. And that hospitalization hearing is going to um, again deal with um, evaluations and the like as to what is appropriate to make sure that this person is not a danger to themselves or others and what degree of uh, treatment and supervision is necessary by the Department of Mental Health to protect the public. What Rule 16.1 is about is whether or not the state can convict somebody criminally. It's not about danger to self or others. It's about um, the constitutional rights that people have to defend themselves and to make sure that they're getting a fair trial. Subsequent to, to that, there are other due process protections that take place in the hospitalization hearing. And that is where um, the details of protection of the public um, are addressed specifically whether the person's a danger to themselves or others, and what conditions are required effectively um, to make sure that the, the public is protected. Completely different proceeding, completely different issues. This is this right here, 16.1, is about due process rights during the criminal proceeding. It has nothing to do with protecting the public at all. All right. Um, anybody? Thank you. Any other questions from Matt? Okay. okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Any comments, uh, Pepper or David Shear? David Chair with you. Oh, Pepper. Yes. Sorry. It's, um, you know, I, I understand, you know, we had this conversation last year, of course, about this section of the, of the bill. Um, you know, arguably, I, I would just say at the outset that what this section allows is for a reasonable psychiatric evaluation. Um, I think that's an important threshold. A court needs to determine already under this language that the, psyche, the subsequent 
um, evaluation by a state prosecution hired uh, evaluator is reasonable. And so there will be threshold questions that the court's going to ask about why uh, the, um, you know, the DMH hired evaluator uh, was insufficient. And, you know, when I think about why a, a evaluation might be insufficient, you know, I just look at the actual Shero case where arguably the state had this authority prior to the Shero case. The Supreme Court subsequently said that that wasn't okay. And, uh, you know, in that case, um, you know, without wasting too much of the committee's time, the defendant, you know, strangled his domestic partner to death um, while he was awaiting kind of, uh, you know, his evaluation, he attempted to hang himself. And afterwards, he claimed that he had amnesia about the murder. And there was two evaluations done, a defense evaluation and the DMH evaluation. Um, both of those evaluations called into question whether uh, this amnesia um, was, was legitimate. Um, the defense hired expert suggests, you know, in, in her report, suggested that there might be some exaggeration. Um, and then the DMH expert in his evaluation said, uh, it could always be the case that a second opinion might come out different than, than this one. And that's all in the printed case. Um, and so what we're asking for here is the ability, if we're getting kind of conflicting uh, information to be able to hire just a, a third evaluator and I don't know, David, if you want to add on to that. Thanks, Pepper. Uh, that, that was a good summary of the of the fundamental issue. And it is, you know, this was a discussion we had last year and the committee did decide to move forward with the bill as it's currently drafted. The issue here is in large part, can there be a meaningful hearing about competency if a state's attorney or, attorney, or assistant attorney general cannot contest whether or not, you know, cannot contest the findings of the court ordered examination. Before the Shero case, that was routinely allowed. Shero, as a matter of statutory interpretation, uh, said that the statute didn't allow it. And all this is trying to do is return the state of the law to uh, what was commonly allowed beforehand. I understand Shero had discussions about constitutional issues and basically said that their decision did not contravene constitutional uh, uh, interests, but it did not base its decision on that. That was largely dicta written into the opinion after they came to their holding. Um, and we, you know, it's our, certainly our belief that, that changing it to uh, allow for a meaningful hearing about competence, which is essential in, in our view, uh, also will not contravene constitutional interests. Um, so, you know, we supported this provision last year, we support it still, and uh, believe that it is really a return to the prior state of affairs and uh, um, not constitutionally problematic. Hey, thank you. Eric, would it be possible to get a copy of the Cheryl case? Yes, absolutely. I think I've sent it before, but I'll, I'll, I'll resend it to make sure. I'm sure you have. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'll resend it. Okay. Um, we're going to. Uh, I'm going to add one thing. Yeah, pl please do add that. Yep. All right. So, what uh, I think what Pepper is suggesting is that the word reasonable in J submit to a reasonable mental examination allows the court create some standard for the court. And what I'm suggesting, if you're gonna do anything like this, um, and, and of course I, I, I don't, and I'm not even sure if this would stand up to constitutional muster, but um, I would suggest that you put a standard in there for when, what reasonable means. And my suggested standard I think would work, which is um, that the, uh, that the state demonstrate that the uh, independent uh, evaluation by the court is not up to um, medical standards, um, that there is some sort of bias or other reason 
not to 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 uh, um, have a that report be uh, uh, legitimate. Um, and if you know if you can meet the three prongs, then they would be entitled to an additional independent evaluation, not an evaluation selected by the state to give them the result that they want. Uh, I, you know, this, what, it, what this gives rise to is exactly what they were complaining about, which is expert shopping, except for it's the state doing the expert shopping when somebody's liberty is at stake. I, I, if you're gonna, so if you're gonna do something, I would suggest that you define what, what would be required to overcome an independent um, court ordered evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other issues with S3 right now before we jump over to S3? Um, we, um, tomorrow morning, um, is there a need to hear from Julie Tesler anymore? When we mark this bill up tomorrow morning at 8.45, I mean at 8.30. I'm not really sure. I haven't heard uh, any response from them as far as the new amendments go at this time. Uh, we well, can reach out to you, them. And could you check to reach out? I don't want to. Um, because I think we'd just change that, Peggy, to S3 markup and vote. Okay. I know she was trying to find someone to testify because she didn't feel like she was the right person, so. Well, it may or may not be necessary right now. Although there, were, there was a discussion yesterday about um, Rutland Mental Health offering services that aren't available at United Council of Service in Bennington, and I'm sure. So part of that discussion revolved around, is there a geographic, significant geographic differences in designated agencies that create public safety issues in some districts? If I could frame the question that way. Maybe that's a longer discussion and involves health and welfare, but certainly that, that was actually, I think, the question that arose during um, some of the testimony yesterday. Now I can check in with uh, Julie Tesler, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, appreciate it. Um, we're going to take a quick pivot to S3. We'll take, a, I mean, S30. We'll pick up with S3 tomorrow morning at 8. Um, 830, uh, you know, yeah, 830 tomorrow morning. Can I ask a quick question about the markup tomorrow morning on S3? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to um, look at a clean draft or do you want to continue to I look at I think we the... should look at a clean draft with the um, language that has been provided this morning by the by the uh, attorney general and state's attorneys, that's moved out. So probably be draft two point one or. Yep. And also, should I caption it as a uh, committee amendment at this time, or? Uh, yeah, it could be. Well, you can keep my name on it, the whole thing. Okay. Um, but I I would highlight that I think our main area right now is down to section four. Rule 16.1. I, ju I just sent the case to Peggy to forward to the committee and to post. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Jump over to S3 in a second. Um, I'm going to, why don't we take a 30 second break if we could, Ms. 